Now for tonight's presentation, John Ray is going to talk about foils and rudders. And uh, John works at a company called Competition Composites and it's based in Ironprior. Now it has a whole series of different product lines. And one of those product lines um, is uh, the provision of replacement and also redesigned rudders. Now, I guess none of this would happen to us, but if your rudder, certainly not a skipper, but if a rudder happened to find a spot in the river where the bottom came up to the top and there's a difficulty, he's the guy you want to talk to at some point about uh, replacement. So John Ray has been a sailing instructor, a racing coach and an active racer. And I guess like all of us, he says he's still learning uh, in spite of doing this for over 40 years. Uh, he currently has a J-22 and he volunteers on the NSC Board of Directors. Uh, he is the NSC Club Treasurer. And John's also the Sales Director for uh, CCI and that's Competition uh, Composites. So I'll turn things over to John and uh, we can proceed with the presentation. Park, thanks very much for the introduction. And Tony, thank you very much as well for putting this all together. I'm just going to go to share my screen. I can. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is just run through a uh, about 30 slides. <clears throat> It'll take about, uh, hopefully about 20, 25 minutes to run through that. Um, and then we'll do a little Q&A at the end. <clears throat> But first, I'd like to start off with a little bit of a company overview. I'll just go through and give you a little bit of history on, on CCI, just where we came from and uh, just basically what we do. As Park mentioned, we've sort of stretched out beyond uh, uh, just rudders. Um, but then I'll focus in on the, the rudder side of the production. It, it represents about 20% of our business. Um, and most of that is in the, uh, the US, but there's about, uh, we ship all around the world. Um, as I was mentioning to the guys the other night, we ship to uh, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, pretty much everywhere. So we're currently based in Armprior, Ontario. We moved out there about four years ago now, four and a half years ago, uh, to a plant, a much larger plant with 18,000 square feet. <clears throat> and we service a, a, much, a, a number of vertical markets, including in the marine industry, communication, medical equipment, uh, renewable energy, um, fish tanks, construction, defense. Um, and all those products that, that's, that fit those marketplaces are things like radomes, obviously the marine foils. Uh, we'll see a bunch of boat parts that we do. Um, we do gamma ray beds for best terratronics, um, some wind turbine blades, as I mentioned, fish tanks. And we've recently got into making huts and kiosks for, uh, for a number of projects, mostly for the uh, federal government. Um, so the marine side, one of the projects that we've, we've started up recently, um, we're signed an agreement recently with a company called Carbon Marine uh, to make their Volteri, which is a, uh, a prototype for an electric powered boat. Um, I'm just going to run a video here to showing the, uh, we're actually just finished off making the deck mold for it. Uh, there's a time lapse of the uh, infusion that was taking place a little while ago for the deck mold. Um, the, it's a boat design that came out of Florida and then was brought up to Canada. Um, and so we've, we've done a lot of work to make these molds and uh, now we're going to be putting together parts for the boats. There's about four uh, uh, boats that we need to be building over the next uh, few months. So it's going to be a busy time. Uh, but you can see the, uh, the infusion process uh, taking place. This is, took about six hours to do this infusion. I'll just move on to the next slide. Nope. Let me skip one more. Uh, another project that we do is for the Venturi. Um, these are jet engine uh, test venturies. 
Um, so they're fairly large pieces. This one's about 30 feet long uh, that we did in our shop out in the arm prior. Uh, we do these for MDS Arrow, uh, which we usually do uh, probably about two or three complex uh, uh, composite projects every year. As I mentioned, we're starting to get into huts and kiosks. Um, these are actually a kiosk that we did for the, the Canadian Border Security Agency. Um, these are going up on the border between Alaska and British Columbia. Um, so it's a, uh, currently we've made two of them and there's supposedly another six more that they're, they're planning to order uh, once these first two are installed. On the communication side, we do radomes, and these are uh, basically an antenna covers for whether it's radars or uh, any kind of communication ones. These are for search and rescue uh, for your uh, e -per or perbs, sorry, the personal uh, rescue devices. So if you do fall overboard, um, they'll send out a notification. And these antennas are positioned all around the world uh, for detecting those uh, communication and then for locating the position of emergency response uh, uh, indicators. We do these for Honeywell. We've been doing this quite a while. We've probably made about, oh, probably about 100 or so of these at least. Also mentioned wind blades. Um, the wind blade that you're seeing on the truck is about a 30 foot long uh, wind turbine blade. Uh, this is for a company out of Toronto. It's a prototype for a, a three wind blades that go on the hub of the much larger wind blades out of, uh, uh, so the 125 foot long blades, these actually go onto the hub uh, to get more power out of the hub. So some of the older uh, wind turbines that are out there, <clears throat> by doing this uh, upgrade, they're hoping to improve or optimize the, the power of these by about 15%. And we also do much smaller ones too. These are some little three foot ones, three foot blades for um, just generating power in some remote uh, locations, just using wind power, obviously. As I mentioned, gamma ray beds, uh, we make these for Best Heratronics. This is for their cancer treatment beds. Um, so we've been doing these uh, for a couple of years now. Um, they're a really nice piece. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we were able to keep open during the uh, pandemic is because we were doing this metal equ medical equipment and as well as the government projects. Through this COVID-19, we've actually been able to stay open the whole time, uh, which has been great for us. A uh, bit challenging at times. We've obviously had to make some changes to our, our processes and protocols, but uh, uh, we have been able to keep working and we currently have about uh, 14 employees right now in the shop. As I mentioned, we do rudders is about 20% of our business. Uh, a lot of things that we do is for a lot of custom work that we do for uh, builders such as Lyman Morris, out of Maine, uh, Brooklyn Boatyards is out of Maine, and so does Front Street Boatyards. Uh, we also do, uh, we're the preferred uh, supplier for uh, rudder builds for far yacht design. Uh, we do a lot of replacement rudders for their first series yachts. Uh, of course, we'll do some custom ones for uh, gentlemen uh, designers like Jim Taylor, um, Van Gorkum, um, and a number of others. Some of the OEM boats that we build or build new or replacement ones for are Beneteau, J-Boats, um, replacement ones, Mirage, uh, currently do some for x yachts right now. Uh, CNC's, uh, obviously a lot of CNC's out there, so we're doing those. Farriers, these are the trimorans that are out there. You know, we have a few of them around uh, at Nepean Sailing Club <clears throat> and of course sharks and many more. And one of the things that people do come to us for is doing modified designs. Uh, so custom designs, often they'll have an old design rudder that they'll want to uh, make a little more, uh, uh, get a more grip, grippier by having it a more elliptical shape, a little deeper, perhaps, um, whatever it is they're trying to do, or it'll make it shallower if they're converting their boat from a, a deep draft keel to a shallow draft keel, they'll come to us to come for a, a modified design that will uh, extend the life of their boat. 
So what I'd like to do is sort of walk through the stages of why somebody is, is going to need a rudder. Why do I need a rudder? Um, and then when you, should they need a rudder? You know, what stages do they go through to rebuild that rudder? Um, so there's design stage. Um, there's, in our case, we do a CNC milling of the foam core. Um, it's either the post is either be a stainless steel or carbon. And then of course the process is of vacuum bagging, laminating, vacuum bagging, priming, fairing and sanding, and of course the finished coat and then shipping it off to the client. So how do I know I need a rudder? So as Park pointed out, sometimes things uh, go bump in the night. Uh, you may have found a couple of our sales reps or met a couple of our sales reps out there, Blueberry and uh, Britannia Shoal. Um, another problem is uh, delamination is common in, uh, in molded rudders, especially. Um, or if you've just bought a boat, your marine surveyor may have said that you've got uh, moisture or pointed out some damage that you've come along the way. Um, this on the pictures of seen on the right is uh, one obviously uh, found a bottom that was actually a local boat. And the, the post that you see on the left is off of a, I think it was a J boat. So a common occurrence in older boats is delamination, especially with a molded rudder. Um, you'll see, especially in the picture on the left, you'll see where that, it's got that clean edge all the way on the routes outside of the, the rudder blade where that delamination has taken place. And so with a molded rudder, you have the two sides of the shell of the, uh, the mold. They're laid up with gel coat and resin fiberglass, but then they're closed together and then they're filled with uh, expandable foam. So once they're filling with expandable foam, there's no way to see if there's any gaps or voids within that rudder, uh, but you also have that seam that goes all the way around the outside edge. And especially at the top where the post uh, enters the rudder. So this, it's a potential uh, for ingress of water. Um, so if you do any damage or hit anything, it doesn't have to be a hard impact, but even the flexing of the rudder will cause the, that mold uh, seam to separate over time. You get the ingress of water. And then if you're in the north, <clears throat> northern climates where there's freezing through the winter time and you get that expansion and contraction, then you're gonna get that delamination. This is where you see a separation. Uh, the, Rudder blade on the right was what's left of a, uh, I think it was an Abbott 36 that was sailing out down east. <clears throat> and they suddenly realized they had no steerage and there was nothing left but a bit of post. And, and that turned up on the shore a few, uh, <clears throat> a few days later. So <clears throat> once we do get a, uh, a rudder that comes to us, uh, first step is for us to uh, take a 3D scan of that. Uh, before we used to actually lay the rudder down on a cardboard, trace it out, take dimensions off of that measurements. But now we've gone high tech and we have this 3D scanner that allows us to take uh, accurate measurements of the rudder. Um, so we can do, then do a replication. We can import that into, uh, uh, we use Rhino for, our, uh, for 3D drawing and then we can take, make a replication. And from there, then we're going to uh, <clears throat> create milling files so that we can actually mill the foam core. <clears throat> As I said, we take that 3D scan and then make it pretty and line it all up. And then you'll see, we, we can make a 3D rendering of the, the rudder. Um, I think it's a, a, a Ben 10R rudder. Um, you can see, with the carbon post, we have the uh, stainless steel sleeves and the completely finished, nicely shaped rudder. And from there, we can go to milling the foam core. Um, for foam core, we use an H80 structural foam. Um, and those are bonded together to get the correct height. If there's a post involved, then obviously we're doing two sides of two halves of the, the rudder and CNC milling uh, the outside foil shape and of course, we have to flip it over and mill the inside for the, the, the shape of the post and any fins as well. Our shop currently has, we have two uh, three axis CNC's. One's a four foot by eight foot with a four inch a drop, the Z drop on it. Um, we've just invested uh, about a year ago in a five axis 
which is a two meter by five meter by one and a half meter Z drop. Um, that allows us to do uh, much larger parts uh, for some of the other projects we do, especially when we're doing uh, uh, large scale molds. If we're doing a carbon, uh, a carbon post, um, it's a little different production than say if you're doing a stainless steel and aluminum post. Um, for doing the, we, we have to create a kitting template for the carbon post. Uh, so basically we'll, we'll use the uh, CNC uh, to mill out the actual shape outline of the, um, the cloth, the carbon cloth that's gonna be cut. Um, so you can then lay out the cloth on it and then cut along those lines uh, for the pattern that's gonna be uh, used uh, to, to create the post. And then you can see on the picture on the right, uh, this is actually the wet layup of the, uh, those pieces that are then overlapped and laid up. And then they're gonna roll that um, into, uh, uh, into a tube basically or into the mold um, with a, uh, a plastic wrap on the outside, the external edge of the, of the post. And of course on the inside, so you have a, it's gonna be a hollow tube post. Um, and then we use that, we vacuum bag that to then expand it um, out to the outside edge of the inside of the mold, if that makes sense. Um, and that's how we get a good solid shape and uh, it's gonna take on the shape of the mold. <clears throat> so here's the actual um, uh, carbon post has been taken out of a, a mold. Uh, you can see that's, uh, it's got the complete shape of the, uh, 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 the, the mold. <clears throat> So the post mold itself has been CNC milled. Um, and then of course it's vacuum bag, as I mentioned before. And then after we've taken it out up actually in the mold, it actually goes in and gets uh, autoclaved. So we have a, a long tube autoclave, which is uh, 20 feet long with about a 12, 12 inch diameter that we're able to basically cook and pressurize the uh, posts to make sure they're cured completely. Metal posts, uh, we do those as well. Oftentimes uh, we do reuse the existing post uh, for most cases. Oftentimes it's just that if the post has just been delaminated and the uh, rudder post has not been bent or hasn't been, uh, there isn't too much pock marks in it from salt water, we can actually reuse that post. And it's really basically stripping it down and then uh, and, and, and scoring it and, and cleaning it up and then we're able to, to reuse it, which saves quite a bit of money for somebody who's uh, having to replace the rudder. Uh, but if they do have to get a new metal post, we do uh, use a metal fabricator. Um, so it'll be designed up uh, from the original, take measurements from the original post or doing our best guess if there's not that much left of the post itself, if it's broken off or bent off. And then of course we have to mark on there any places where there's keyways, quadrants, tiller arms, e-tiller sockets. Um, and of course, accurate measurements are pretty key at this stage of the game. So once we have a post, we then can uh, bond it onto the, uh, bond the cores onto the post itself. Um, that's using a West system epoxy thickened with 407 um, and then to fill in any gaps and bond it along the, uh, the post itself. So then it gets vacuum bag laminated. So once the, uh, the fiberglass is laid up um, uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the core itself uh, with epoxy resin, then it gets vacuum bagged. So there's good pressure all the way around the uh, outside edge of the, uh, of the uh, blade. Um, so they have good symmetrical shape to it and good pressurization. So the, uh, the epoxy gets absorbed in. Here's an example of an infusion, uh, very similar to the uh, one you saw for the boat, but this is for a J160 that we did recently. This was probably about three hours, two to three hours of uh, time lapse compressed into, uh, 
to see the infusion. This was actually, a re, re, you can see on the left, we were actually able to reuse his uh, carbon post and all he needed was a new blade that had been uh, damaged and water infiltration. I think you get the general idea there. So, sorry, jumped ahead again. So once it's been laminated, uh, it's then fared with uh, a, a mix of West Marine epoxy and 410 fairing compound. Um, this, way, this is where they, uh, uh, they'll put that layer over and they'll be able to sand and then prime the, uh, uh, the, the surface. So it's really, at this point, they'll, uh, this is really to give that extra layer of coverage over the, uh, over the blade itself. And then of course to sand it smooth. Um, as I said, mentioned primer coat is applied, uh, more fairing and sanding. So it's really getting into the near that finished state um, of the rudder. Um, but this is just making it, uh, giving it that final shape. Uh, there'll be some templating taking place as well. So that the, uh, uh, we'll make sure that it has a, a nice foil shape, a symmetrical foil shape, which is really key in the rudder. Um, so you have good, uh, good clean steerage. So for confidence composite posts, we also have to add on sleeves. Um, oftentimes there are stainless steel sleeves that, and this is really the bearing surface for if you've got a, a bearing, um, uh, you need to have a good solid, good smooth bearing surface for those bearings to run on. Um, so top and bottom, obviously, you can see in the, in the middle of this one, uh, we'll either put on a, uh, uh, there's a gator that's positioned here. Um, if you can follow my mouse, this section here is actually uh, for a quadrant, I should say, not a gator, <coughs> a quadrant. Um, so we get it, we'll, we'll uh, add fiberglass or carbon, usually fiberglass, because it's an insulation against uh, any electrostatic or trolysis, I should say, and allows you to uh, fit the uh, quadrant on properly for, for wheel steered boats. Uh, one of the things we do offer is a uh, four coats of Interprotect barrier coat. And so it's Interprotect 2000E. Um, this is to uh, <clears throat> give it that coating to uh, uh, prevent osmosis in the, uh, the rudder blade itself. Um, so it just gives it an extra layer and then it's, it can be then finished or lightly sanded and uh, anti fouling can be applied. Oops, once again, jumping ahead. And then job done. This is when uh, it's shipped off and whether it's a uh, foil, a dagger board or a rudder, uh, we do custom crates. Uh, Cause I've mentioned before, we're shipping all over the world. Um, and so they have to arrive safely and make sure that they're protected in their transport, so. Some of the other parts that we make, um, we've, one thing that's been uh, very popular these days is actually e-rudders. Uh, we're making more and more of these e-rudders that are going on larger and larger boats as more and more people are setting sail around the world and they want that additional safety of uh, having an emergency rudder um, should anything happen to their existing rudder. Uh, so the one on the right actually is a very nice uh, e-rudder that we did for a J125 it was, it's doing the plan to do the transpac this year. <clears throat> um, you can see on the left, there's a tiller that we did and a transom uh, plate, uh, which has the gudgeons on it. And then of course the cassette. Um, and then a, but a, it's probably about a six and a half foot, seven foot blade on there for, uh, so the steering should anything happen. Another thing we do is uh, spinnaker poles. We also do bow spritz. Um, the bowsprit you see on the bottom left there is off of a FAR 30. Um, so we're doing those for FAR 30s. We also do them for um, a, a boat that we do the rudders for as well as a production boat, which is the MAT 1070. Uh, they're a company out of Turkey. 
Um, so they've been, uh, uh, they've done the 1010 and they're doing 1070. And they're also come to us and looking for uh, production of a boat, a 1340. Uh, so we hope to expect that to start up uh, in the fall or over the next winter. That was it, it went very fast. <clears throat> So I'll open up the floor to questions and. I see a couple of that came in on chat and uh, maybe we'll just deal with them first and I'll ask people to uh, try and use the Q&A to the extent they can. Uh, first one is uh, how long does it take from start to finish? Uh, if you got the order to build the rudder? Uh, well, it depends on how busy we are, but usually when from we get uh, a rudder in to design, um, uh, milling foam and everything, that's, it's usually about a four week, four to five weeks. Um, right now with our production schedule, because it's, uh, it's coming into the, the spring launch time, um, right now the turnaround's probably in the eight to nine week um, turnaround. So really what you're saying is it's great that the Ottawa River is high water, usually in the early part of the year into the middle part of the year, because if you have to have a rudder remade for you, that's it. Yeah, our, I mean, our quiet period is usually in the summertime when everybody's on the water and sailing, so. Or waiting um, for a rudder. <laughs> so if you're, you know, it's, it's usually for people who, this time of year, it's people who have bought a new boat um, and they've had a survey done, uh, they need to get a replacement, or they've got big plans, they're going offshore. Um, and as I mentioned, we do a lot of it for custom manufacturers. We, we've shipped quite a few uh, uh, rudders already this year that are for new custom boats that are being built. Um, so yeah, but local around here, it's, you know, we get the, the sort of the end of the season after people pull their boats out of the water um, and they see what damage they've done or, or you know, they're, they see a lot of water coming out of the out of the rudder, um, and same in the spring. They they the, the boat will be uh, on the hard for the winter, and then it may be delaminating, and um, there's rust coming out of it. So there's all sorts of indicators of uh, ongoing damage. I mean, one of the things about you know the Ottawa River is there's not a lot of new boats here. There are mostly you know boats that have got a few years on them, um, and so you're seeing that age uh, over time. Okay. Um, there's a question that came in here about uh, when reproducing a replacement rudder uh, and maybe you don't have the background as to where the rudder came from or how old, because it was old and maybe that company's no longer in business, the uh, specifications for the rudder aren't available. How do you decide on the uh, composite layup? Like what weight of carbon or glass goes in to ensure that you have enough strength and so on? Uh, for the size of boat. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few guidelines, and uh, Phil Locker is our, our main designer on that. I won't try to pretend to be the the, the designer, but uh, we have enough experience uh, over the years, or he has enough experience over the years that he has a pretty good idea, judge. And it's usually dependent on uh, they have some calculations that they use to determine uh, the forces that are going to be on that rudder uh, based on the size of the boat, the weight of the boat the speed that the boat will travel and those loads that will be affected when it does a hard stop. Um, so you're coming off a wave and you you have to do a hard turn of the rudder and that's when it gets fully loaded. They, he does some calculations to determine what the worst case scenarios are and what loads need to be, uh, 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 what it needs to support. Um, and that's where, uh, uh, so it's usually, you know, in the case of most rudders, uh, most fiberglass rudders with foam core, um, usually about a three layers of 17 ounce uh, infused is plenty. If we do in carbon, you don't need quite so many layers. Um, <clears throat> and it's the same with the uh, post as well. Um, so determining that up. If we don't have the original specs of the boat, we can usually figure it out from that. Okay. Um, I noticed that in each of the pictures you showed, John, that uh, the rudder post seems to be very, very close to the leading edge of the rudder, where I thought 
it might be a bit further back closer to let's say the center of effort uh it's an airfoil essentially that's vertical rather than horizontal like a wing yeah. but uh i thought it would be closer to the center of effort so that the rudder would be more balanced uh, well you want you want that balance a little further forward actually you, you know so there will always be force on the rudder yeah, i don't know if it's because it's force on the rudder but you just want that balance um it's about 14 percent um back from the uh from the leading edge. Okay. Yeah, because you don't want it just to uh, wander around, I guess. You want always some uh, force. You have to be able to turn one way, have to be able to turn another way. Okay. I just noticed it that way. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll go over with some of these questions here. Uh, do you have experience in the company with uh, fabricating emergency rudders for a cruiser, a 50 foot cruiser? And yep. I think you probably yep. do. Yes, we do. Yeah, we've done a few uh, a much larger cruisers. And uh, so, yes, if you, um, there's on our website, I don't know if we've got anything on our website for 50, but we're currently doing a 46-foot e-rudder, a 50-foot um, e-rudder. E and we've actually got about four e-rudders in right now. So they range anywhere from 35-foot boats up to 56-foot boats, I believe. OK. Um, you have the profiles, I guess it's the cross section really, are the profiles for uh, most stock rudders like uh, an Edel uh, 820. Not necessarily. I, I'm not sure about the Adels. Um, we do have a number of um, stock rudders that we've built already um, using, you know, we've obviously, if, if a rudder has come to us, we'll take a scan of it or take the design and we'll, we'll save that. Um, this, but just, I'd have to look up at our, our database to see what we'd actually have, or our library to see what we'd actually have in, in availability. But it's not too hard for us to you know, come up with a design for a new one. Sure. Okay. Um, there's a question here about uh, rudders for uh, small boats. And uh, I think that might have been years ago when your company first started. Um, is it still cost effective or is that still a way of doing do you have a way of doing that uh we 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 don't we've, we've tended to steer away from the dinghy side of the marketplace i mean if somebody is you know absolutely must have one um, we still make them for the cl16 um, because there's nobody making cl16 rudders anymore or center boards um you know we have we've done the odd albacore rudder and center board we do them, it's not, it's not a focus for our business. Uh, we found the dinghy market is just, a, it's a very tough business to make any money at if you're doing, uh, you know, when there are molded parts out there for much less expensive. Uh, we have found that uh, uh, build, building rudders for boats that are about 25 feet and, and bigger, um, that's when we start making money. It's, uh, and it really, it's about 30 feet or more to be quite honest, but it's a uh, uh, small, boat market is a tough market. That's interesting. It almost sounds a bit like some of the sailboat manufacturers back in the late 70s and 80s, yeah. where yeah. they moved up to larger and larger boats because the uh, margins on those were much better. Yeah, that's correct. OK. Um, can you build extendable carbon fiber tiller extensions? No. <laughs> no, okay. no, we don't. I mean, if you want a tube, we can get a carbon fiber tube, but uh, it's not a, again, it's, it's a, that type of ex expanding one or uh, you're looking, you're talking about the twisting one and then extending out and twisting the lock. No, we don't do that. Okay. All right. Um, many people have rudders with quite a bit of play in the rudders due to wear in the rudder shafts or in the bushings. Uh, do you have any recommendations for local suppliers for new Delrin rubber bush or rudder bushings? Uh, Delrin, uh, we can, if you want, we can uh, provide a Delrin bushing, um, depending on the size of it. Um, but yeah, if you've got the dimensions, we can quote on a, a making a replacement Delrin bushing. 
That's almost a machine shop job, though, isn't it? If it, you have... it really is. We can we can do it on our CNCs, yeah. Um, but it is a machine shop job. But we can do it on any one of our CNCs. Will do it as well. Um, it seems to me that's something that can be done, as you say, with a machine shop, and perhaps easier and more routine for them than you. Yeah. yeah. It pro yes, and we do, uh, um, and sometimes we do outsource it, depending on. Uh, the number of things, number of uh, parts involved, and sometimes it's just easier for them to do it too. Sure. Um, I had a question here. I guess they were intrigued with one of your other product lines, and you showed that kiosk that was being built for the border, for yep. uh, border services, be, uh, for a spot between Alaska and I guess, uh, is it the Yukon? Uh, British Columbia. Or British Columbia, okay. Yeah. Um, why did they actually do it? Is it because of the weight or the durability or because you had more an ability to get more, uh, I guess it's one piece? Well, in, the, in the northern climate, they wanted to go to a composite structure because in the northern climate, wood um, wood and metal do not stand up well in the, in the deep cold. Um, so they're by building it out of composites and it has a, it has a four inch foam core and then it's laminated on either side uh, with a gel coat finish, which they then put siding over. Um, but it just gives that le extra level of insulation and it'll be more durable over time to uh, to withstand the, the, the cold conditions. Okay. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking, as you heard about uh, the boats that fly over the waves rather than uh, the rest of them like they'll go through the waves Do you build any of the foils for those sorts of boats? No, it's the same type of thing. We've done some repairs for some of those boats that have managed to find hard spots on the river, but no, we don't uh, We don't make uh, those foils. Okay. Uh, let's see here. The questions are all jumping around in front of me as I'm trying to find them. Um, there's comments here on, uh, do you have any, um, words to say about the construction of the foils on the America's Cup boats. I think they're absolutely spectacular. <laughs> uh, there's no there's no other way to describe it. I mean, when I first saw those mono holes full foiling on the wings hanging out the side, it was just, uh, it's incredible. The, the, the engineering that's involved in that is just spectacular. Right. Um, Oh, it's going to be, I'm not sure you can answer this or it's even. No, if he wants to, my email is on the page. If he wants to send me an email, somebody's asking for a quote on an e-rider. Um, he's more than happy to send me an email and I'll provide a quotation for him. Yeah, I think that's a better idea than you trying to say, well, it's going to be so many, you know, give or take 200%. Yeah. yeah. So There's a, when you when we're doing an e-rider, the, the, the big, big challenge there is actually fitting it to the transom of the boat. So depending on whether you have an open transom, a, 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 horse, a vertical transom, sorry, a, yes, vertical. Um, and whether, whether there's a bunch of a rake on the transom as well. So you saw in that one uh, picture that I showed with the E-Rudder um, that had, a, we were doing on a J125 that has quite a rake on it. So we had to build a, a, a transom plate that would actually set up the gudgeon so that it was gonna be on the vertical. Um, so you get more blades in the water and directly down. Um, so there's, we, the quote would depend on, you know, how much work needs to be done to get that to hang on to the back of the boat. A lot of times you may need to, uh, uh, some boats will have to build their own uh, uh, gantry system uh, to fit on the transom to hold the, uh, uh, the, the cassette. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I had a question that I, I don't know very much about carbon fiber. Don't know very much about fiberglass itself, but uh, I know more about it, I guess. Um, is carbon fiber that much more impervious to water than, uh, let's say a fiberglass rudder? Or is it just stronger? Um, that's a good question. Is it more impervious? I don't know if it's any more impervious. Um, I mean, the resin is the same. Um, it's really the strength of the weight to strength uh, ratio 
of carbon versus fiberglass. Um, that's kind of the, the, the main difference in the two. Okay, so it's just a matter of weight saving, which- Weight, for, we, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For uh, cruising boats, maybe for what we're used to on the Ottawa River, maybe that isn't a big deal. But if you're going around the world, well, uh, you know, it's you don't have to be on a light boat to go around the world. You can be on a heavier boat. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, usually carbon is used for more uh, racing conscious boats or uh, speed conscious boats that are trying to, you know, look for a little advantage by getting if they want a carbon post and rudder blade. They're trying to re reduce the weight in the transom of the boat, uh, the back end of the boat, and so they can either. <clears throat> get rid of a, the fat skipper or they can uh, reduce the rudder. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Just a moment. There's a couple of more here, I think. Um, uh, there is somebody asked about a transom hung rudder. Is there wow. typically any internal structure other than a foam core? Uh, transom hung rudders, um, yeah, there's usually uh, quite often there's a wood core as well. Uh, it'll be a combination of wood and foam core. Okay. Interesting. So, see if there's any other questions. We're going to have sort of a asking once, asking twice. Anyone else this evening? Well, I think you've got off relatively lightly, John. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much for uh, the presentation. Uh, I've learned quite a bit myself about uh, rudders. Um, I've certainly heard a little bit through, you know, around the fireside, so on and so forth, about how they're built, so on and so forth, but nothing really very much uh, compared to what you've outlined here tonight. So thank you again. So thank you very much for uh, participating and uh, uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.